And the broadcast is live. Phil Tarrant, Momentum Media, Tom Panos, Real Estate Jim. I didn't realize, Tom, I know you're a pretty important man in real estate, but you're a proper property celebrity these days. You're on the block in a couple of weeks' time. What's happening? Well, we're on the block this week. We're on the block this week. The block is being filmed on Saturday night. Mm. Sorry, the, the block is being filmed on Saturday, and we've got to sign confidentiality agreements on what actually happens on the Saturday. And then on Sunday night, they do the finale, that is the auction, to see who the winner of the of the block is. It's been going for a few months now. And mm. um, the one there's five different auctioneers, there's five different real estate companies, and um, there's five vendors, five properties. And the one that I'm doing is for um, Luke and Luke and Luke and Josh, the two boys from Sydney, in uh, actually not far from where you live, out north, um, two twin brothers. And um, I've got to tell brothers, you, aren't they just twin brothers, Tom? Yes, sorry, twin brothers. <laughs> yes, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, sorry, sorry, mate. I sorry. can't help myself. Sorry. No, that's correct. I am listening. No, that's correct. Yes. I am listening. Correct, Luke, Luke and Josh. And I really listen. I mean, it's a big deal for me to go there because at the moment, Phil, I'm doing 25 auctions a weekend. And I'm leaving there to go do one auction, you know. But I've got I've got an emotional reason to do it. And they, their dad's quite um, he's he's not an older dad. He's quite young. He's got a he's got a terrible illness. I think it's the illness that comes from um, asbestos. And um, you know he's uh, it's it's been a very you know it's life is hard. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. And, um, you know, as soon as the guys, I met up with them and I had dinner with them one night um, and uh, Phil, as soon as they told me the story, I sort of said, yeah, listen, mate, let's uh, let's let's do it. Uh, little did I know at the time, but Phil, that, man, there'd be a lot of complications. One of them is that I'm letting down a fair few of my clients here in Sydney. The second one is, man, the quarantine issue, but that's gone away. Thank God it only happened last week. I mean, I... I, I would have had to have quarantined in Melbourne at a hotel, um, which, I mean, it's not what I'd want to be doing, you know. Yeah, that's cool. So, um, well, that, that that's a, a nice backstory uh, to, I guess, give you a bit more purpose to doing the auction. But the idea is, is that they say this is a reserve, and someone works out what that is, and then anything over the reserve that that fat on top of it is what determines whether or not you're the winner. So it's the most over reserve. Is it an absolute number or is it a percentage of the reserve? How does it work? Don't I don't know. know. I don't know. I don't know. But the at a oh, high let level, me reframe what? that question, Tom. Are you going to win? Yeah. Well sport odds say no because um someone sent you me a screenshot it. yeah someone sent me a screenshot of it and um 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 sport odds uh, uh, uh haven't got it up there um but you know then again like i've been in real estate long enough to know that phil a property is worth not what the punters say but what the buyer says a property is worth not what a valuer says it's what the buyer says so i've just got to hope that there's a buyer that sees the incredible work that these guys have done in it and that that person is emotionally connected and that person turns around and says, I will buy it no matter what it takes. They're the kind of uh, buyers you want in real estate. And I've got to tell you, Phil, they're still out there all week. I've auctioned, I auctioned last night. I auctioned the night before. I'm auctioning tonight. I'm even auctioning on Saturday online from Melbourne. I'm auctioning on Sunday when I fly back from Melbourne the stock levels are through the roof, Phil. They are through the roof. But I've got to say to you, without putting tickets on myself, I suggest everyone Google Tom Panos, Daily Telegraph, and read the article that I put out there three months ago. So every month, news, part of my commitment is I've got to provide content to News Corp that goes across all its publications. And I put on an article saying that it's booming now, but if you're a buyer, don't despair. In the month of November and December, you are going to be having happy pickings. It's going to be like you're going into a lollipop shop and you're not going to know what to pick from. And guess what, Phil? I was spot on. 
that's exactly what has happened. Unprecedented stock levels. Yeah, the uh, real estate oracle is um, uh, maybe the new name for you, Tom. You know what's happening. You telegraph it, uh, and you are probably oh, investing yourself, mate. Phil, and I and I also and I also I reckon it's got to do. I got an advantage. I think that I'm actually closer to the pulse than the analysts, and the reason oh, why. Mate, I, I I can see I can see a buyer say to me. Tell them to get stuffed. I'm not going to go. I'm not getting carried away with this, man. Stuff it. I'm the one that can actually feel the temperature where people are saying, I'm fed up with these prices. I'm walking away. That's only quantified months later in data, right? So I can see it. And I can also tell you to everyone out there that is saying, hey, man, listen, the boom's over. There's a real estate crash that's coming, Phil. This is the new trending topic. The party's over. Oh, Tommy, did you see what the Governor General said? Inflation's through the roof. APRA, you know, clearance rates are dropping. I've got to say to you, this is a short-lived thing, Phil, because all we're doing now is going through high levels of stock that have hit the market at the one time. And I can tell you, if... If there was 20,000 of these things they were trying to sell, I can tell you, they're going to go cheaper than if there's only one of these they're trying to sell, right? So at the end of the day, it's purely a demand supply thing, a bit of residual stock. It's going to end up being on the market late December. Happy bargain buying for a few buyers who aren't going to go to Westfield, but are going to be looking at property right up until the 18th of December. Then you turn around and you say, come back in the new year, January, man. We're back into a real estate uh, marketplace that has got the lowest interest rates in living memory field. So even if rates were to go up, mate, mate, these things about, oh, if they go up 0.1% or 0.2%, mate, you can get them to go up 2%. You have still got rates at 4.5%, which is nothing. I listed and sold real estate for most of my life, Phil, most of my life in real estate, I was selling real estate at interest rates at a minimum of 5%. So as far as I'm concerned, there have been times it's been 17%, 1989, 17%, 17 So this thing about rates going up, well, hello, what's happened? You've had an ice cream truck, you know, coming around the street giving you free ice cream, for two years, and now they're going to say, we're going to charge you 20 cents. Well, whoopee do. That's my view. So for our younger uh, listeners and viewers there, you've just had uh, an economics lesson, a real estate lesson from the great Tom Panos. Uh, the first one was supply and demand, which was, I've got two packets here of low carb snacks. Uh, if there's only one of them, there's less to go around and therefore they're more expensive, supply and demand. And the other one was the cost of money. And the relevance of the cost of money and uh you know paying a 20 cents extra for your ice cream when you probably should be paying 40 cents more you're still ahead of the game it's pretty mate, pretty simple pretty smart I, oh i heard mate i heard i heard i heard during lockdown i was sitting picking up a coffee from new park cafe and i heard one guy say to another guy mate have you seen the price of cocaine that's gone through the roof and the <laughs> other guy says it doesn't surprise me he goes you can't get it into the country there's not much of it right obviously there were less flights flying in Right. Um, so it's it's a it's a, it's a, it's a business principle that applies to every commodity there is there, Phil. I mean, it doesn't take rocket science to work it out. And if you can understand this principle, it will always help you in life and business. For example, mate, you'd go pick an area that's got limited supply of land, not lots of supply of land. You'd go buy an apartment that's an Art Deco apartment that they don't reproduce anymore and not necessarily buy a brand new apartment that they can build another thousand across the road next year. This is sort of basic stuff that you can turn around and you think about things like this. We're gonna see this for Phil, we're gonna, we see it in, we see it in the labor force. When you start having, you know, a shortage of employees, which we are seeing at the moment in certain industries, you see salaries go up. Yeah, and to your point, Tom, real estate is not difficult. Um, and I'm a property investor, you're a property investor, a lot of property, property investors tune into this, or at least people that support property investors. Uh, those people that over-engineer and over-cook 
and overcomplicate real estate typically are up to something they don't understand themselves there's something they're hiding real estate is really easy and uh, if you want to succeed in real estate you've just built that out exactly who are you up against tom at the block uh who are the other option is do do you know uh i well i know one of them is a guy called and very nice very nice guy he sent me a, a, a um david woods is a guy i'm just going to bring him up very goes to show this uh so I get a text message from a guy yesterday. I think it's David Woods is his name. Let me see if it comes up. Uh, I can't find it. I think it was David Woods from Bill Property. And he said to me, I noticed that you're doing, uh, you're doing the block and um, I'm, I'm in Melbourne. Um, give me a ring if there's anything I can help you with, give you up to speed with things, um, which was, I thought was really nice. You know? That's classy. Uh, McGrath, McGrath. A guy from McGrath's, um, Scott Kennedy Green, who's a mate of mine. Um, uh, Damien Cooley. Of yeah, course. I was going to say, they're going to have to get Damien. He's always there. He, he likes the camera. Actually, he's not there. I'm looking at the list no? now. No, he's not there. Because so Damien's a, a good auctioneer. Very good operator. Good auctioneer. Very good auctioneer. Uh, Cooley Auctions. David. So David Wood, um, I think a guy called Lee Hallow. Uh, listen, they're all, I'm sure they're all, they're all good auctioneers for the mm. record. Let me tell you the whole thing about auctioneers, but Phil, I've got a different view. Maybe it's because it's only 5% of my life, right? Uh, it's a small part of, let's call it the Tom Panos business model, right? I personally think that the time is coming that the new South Wales model takes a leaf out of Victorian model and in Victoria, the real estate agents themselves do the auctions. So when you list when you list a property, Phil, what happens is the agent frequently, most oftenly, is the person that will also be the auctioneer. I've I've been I've been supportive of that model, um, even though on the surface it looks like it's probably not in the favour of someone that does that for part of their life. But I personally think that there are some advantages of having the agent as the auctioneer. Number one, they know the marketplace far better in that area. They live and breathe it. Uh, they know more about the product in that area. They've actually worked on the property for the four weeks. They've actually built a rapport with the buyers before the auction day. They've actually had all the feedback and intel that's come in on that property, so they know the strengths and weaknesses. So there's a lot of there is a lot of pluses there, Phil. Right? Mm -hmm. There's there is a few disadvantages, and I think that sometimes you can become emotionally involved when you're both the lister of the property and you're you know the auctioneer. For instance, you're about to call an auction. First bid is a ridiculously low bid. And you've been working on that property for four weeks and you just sort of think, you know, where on earth did this bid come from, you know? Um, yeah, it works yeah. to be disconnected, no doubt. I, I get sort of both sides of, of the argument. And it's like auctioneering. Is this something you're going to do forever, Tom? Do you, I know you enjoy doing it. And it takes up time and takes away your weekend. But um, how long you know, how long you be an auctioneer for, mate? When are you going to hang up your gravel, gavel? As long as it fits into the model, Phil, which you've heard me say, ELF, effortless, lucrative, and fun. As mm. long as it fits into that model, I'll be doing it. If real estate auctions turned into uh, bingo calling, which some of it is like that when you're just doing an auction platform, like, for instance, the one where you can't see the buyers, right? And what actually happens is numbers are coming through where they press it on a computer system and you just say bid of 37 has made a bid of 1.5 bid of 21 has just registered a bid if it goes down that path and that becomes the new model in real estate you know for me that won't be fun fuel right that won't be fun What's the funnest outside of this uh, real estate exposed uh, every Thursday at about uh, one thirty? What's the funnest part of your professional life, Tom?
Oh, large keynotes, large keynotes. Yeah, because yeah. On, 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 large, on large keynotes, I don't have to do what I do on, on one-on-ones, Phil. I have to tell you, they're intense because I will never, ever have a one-on-one where I'll comfort someone with a lie. I will actually hurt their feelings with the truth because my psychology background and my you know, academic studies clearly show that if you want to create change transformation, that what you should be doing is actually describing things as they are, not better than they are. Don't sugarcoat them, you know. Call it tough love if you like. Yet in a big scenario where you've got a 1,000 people, that's an entertainment show, right? That's a show. You're not talking to one individual person. You're talking to a group of people, be it Eric or one of the events that you hold. And what that is about, it's entertainment. Whether you like to accept it or not, it's about humor. It's about storytelling. It's about making people feel different in that one hour. It's actually something that energizes me and it gives me fun. So I do absolutely love it. But let me preface it and say that if you're looking for change, it can be overrated because essentially what you're doing is you're one of a thousand people sitting there watching, let's call it a more educated version of Netflix is probably the best way to describe it, you know? You reckon you've got better with age on as an entertainer, a business entertainer, I guess you can call it? Up on, so I've seen you t- talk now, speak now, Tom, for, well, it's got to be getting on sort of seven or eight years. Um, and I still enjoy listening to you, even though I've, I've heard you a number of times. Um, um, have you got better, you reckon? What's changed? I know you don't swear uh, as much. Right? You don't swear. I don't, I don't. I don't. I don't swear anymore. I don't swear yeah. anymore because I've got. I've got sponsors that uh, I've got mm. to respect their uh, their feelings and views. Um, it's also um, I got out of the habit. Hab- habits an interesting thing. You stop doing something, you stop doing it. Right? It's, yeah. it's not a you know. Um, uh, do I think I've got better? Um, yeah, hundred mm. percent. And the reason I've uh, the reason I've got better, I think, is that. Um, I don't need the speaking gigs. And when you don't need the speaking gigs, you can actually be of more value uh, yeah. because you can actually, yeah, you know, and I think, and I think that's, I, I mean, I, I, I would, to everyone that's watching this, Bill, I would never, I would never ever be working with uh, a coach or a consultant or a trainer that is not financially secure. And the reason why is that they have a vested interest and that vested interest is they need your money. Mm. So they've got this conflict when they're talking to you. On the one hand, they're sort of saying, I want to help this guy. But on the other hand, if I piss them off, you know what? They might leave. They might leave. They'll get upset. But there comes a time when you don't need their money and you can sit there. And I did this yesterday. I actually said to someone, I said, listen, I think we should just cancel the appointments for the rest of the year. And I think that we should catch up maybe after Australia Day, after you've had a think about it, because the way I see it is that at the end of every call, you say you're going to do this. You send me a text message that you're going to do this. Then when we meet up the following week, you tell me that you've had this issue or you had, you know, this event happen or you had this circumstance and i've just noticed that it's excuse after excuse maybe i'm not your man and you can only do that and let me tell you phil that in itself is coaching believe it or not when you actually it's also also salesmanship tom which you which are pretty handy at but you know i I quite like the, the the analogy or the scenario you use there because the same around your your speaking gigs you know the reason why you can do it and do it so well is that you're highly invested into it and you're not commercially reliant on it and therefore it changes your mindset or your paradigm towards doing it because you want to do it. I I imagine the same applies for the best real estate agents as well. If if you're, what do you call it, commission breath or whatever, um, if you're that guy, it means that you're approaching that very differently to the successful real estate agent who can go into that transaction without being desperate for that. You're going to do a much better job. 100%. 
And the way not to be, de- by the way, the way not to be desperate in real estate is to ensure that you've kept your pipeline strong. Because, mm. Phil, I just want you to picture this. I'm at your house. I'm sitting there with you and your partner. And you say to me, Tom, mate, we don't have to sell, right? We don't have to sell. We can actually sell in five or six years. We can actually rent it out, right? And we can sell in five or six years' time. So just picture me as the agent. I'm an agent that's got another 20 market appraisals to go to in November. I've got a pipeline of sellers coming in, right? And I'll say to you, Phil, if you don't have to sell, you know what? Keep it. You're in a great spot. Keep it. You're in a great spot. What we'll do is let's stay in touch and maybe in, you know, a year or two, we keep revisiting what the state of the market is. Maybe we can help you with a rental if you'd like. We'd love to help you renting it out if you want to hang on to it and rent it out. And um, we do that. Picture that. Now, picture this. Picture someone that's broke. Picture someone that hasn't gone to a listing for a month. Picture someone that's got no one in their pipeline. And they sit there and they say, hey, we don't have to sell, you know. Um, But what do you reckon, Tom? Should we? Man, of course. I need to eat, Phil. I'm desperate. I've got no stock. I've got a family that's needing money for school, for our mortgage. Am I going to sit there and say to you, yeah, just keep it, mate. Do it in five, six years. Potentially, but also maybe not because I've got a conflict there. And that is I need the listing, this commission breadth. So, but I've got to, but I've got to, you know, Phil, we could go on. Look, I'm passionate about this subject, you know, Mm -hmm. because I think, I think a really good advisor has, has two elements, whether you're a salesperson or whether you're a coach. One element is they put the client's interests first. That's the difference between a salesperson and an advisor. And an advisor will put the client's interests first. And the second thing is you've actually got to know, man, you've got to actually have the training. Example, in, in coaching, I've got to tell you, it is extremely useful, Phil, to have done a postgraduate degree in psychology because what actually happens is when I'm sitting there talking to someone, they're talk, there's a great saying, often when someone's got pain in their left hip, the problem might be the right knee, right? That's the skill that you have if you've got some rigorous, robust training to understand, you know, psychology and you know uh cognitive behavior right it actually helps to understand psychology versus sitting there and not being able to see what's really the problem is you know Mm, yeah yeah that's that's um interesting and you know i'm fascinated by psychology i haven't had any professional training or academic but um yeah, you've, got most, most, you've got a high EQ. You've got a high EQ. You've got a high EQ. I'd like to think it's it's pretty reasonable, and and part of that is innate, and part of it is a, a learned, um, a learned behaviour. And I think you get the, the best EQ just by listening to the people, right? Um, and you know that that's a, a skill as a, a real estate agent. But I've got a. It just got me thinking, Tom, around that scenario you painted. Um, we're saying, yeah, just keep it. Don't worry about it. I have a scenario for you, and I think our listeners would probably benefit from um, a debrief on it. And it's a, a, a personal. Uh, story. So I'm I'm transacting property. I'm selling a pro- I'm buying a property, and I'm selling a property in the same area. And it's an area of New South Wales. I, these guys might listen to this, so I won't won't tell you who they are. But um, uh, the story is I'm, I'm buying a place uh, in an area, and probably about 20 kilometres away, uh, I'm selling a place. Now the place I'm buying, uh, I was going down a process, and it was right sort of the middle of the negotiation. And I sort of said to this guy you know, I've got a place down the road. I'm thinking of selling it. Uh, do you want the listing? Uh, and he went, yeah, sure. I'll definitely have a look at it. But the backstory of that is uh, it's an investment property. Um, and the market up there where, where I'm talking about right now is is hot. Uh, and there was some problems with the property. And, the, and the, the property manager said, Phil, mate, this thing's just going to cost you more money. There's buyers galore at the moment. You should think about shifting this right now. And I went, that's a good idea. 
hadn't really thought too much about it. Guess I want to give me a call. So the principal of this particular um, uh, real estate agent uh, gave me a call, said, Phil, yeah, happy to take on your listing. This is the, the this will be the commission structure. I reckon we're going to get about this. And that really got me thinking about this, this, this selling this property while I was transacting with a different agent on the buy side. So I just went, mate, I'll give you the listing if you want. Let's sort of square this away. So the other agent who's the one who originally uh, mentioned it to me sort of called me up going, Phil, are we getting the listing? And I went, I feel really bad. I, actually, I, I do feel bad about it. I said, I'm not going to give you the listing because I'm going to give it to this guy over here who is sitting at the, the sales side at a, at a, uh, a property I'm transacting on right now. So I've, I've had a good experience with him. I'm going to give him the listing. And he was like, well, what can we do to win your business? What, what have we done wrong? And this, that, and the other. And I was like, it's got absolutely nothing to do with you guys. If anything, you've, you've, you've sparked the idea in me to actually sell this property. I actually feel bad about giving it to this other guy because you've done some energy and work into it. And he sort of was trying to extrapolate out of me why they didn't secure the listing. And it was purely because of that reason. But I struggled actually telling him that reason why, because I sort of felt bad about it. But is there any way that guy you think could have played that differently to have to have kept that listing with him rather than me giving it to this other guy? So just again, my because because I might have missed mm. that important part of that story. Yeah. It, the guy that the guy is is the guy that you're buying from going to miss out on the list your listing that you're selling as well. Mm. No, he's going to get it. So he's investment property, it. the investment property, the property manager did his job. He went, you should think about probably selling this. I'll refer you to a guy, their principal. I spoke to him. He said, sell it. I went, that sounds really good. Leave it with me. And then the guy who I'm buying from over here, I went. Oh, this guy wants my listing over here for, for this particular property. Do you want to have a crack at it? So I've given it to the guy who I'm buying the property from. He's now selling this property for me. The guy whose idea it largely was for me to sell it has lost the listing. And he was wondering why he lost it and how he could have kept it. Okay. So, Phil, you're, you're one of thousands that are in the same scenario every year. In real estate, we call it double headers. A double header is that um, what happens is the buyer is buying off an agent and then that agent then gets the benefit of actually selling the property as well and um you know why does it happen i think the fact that you've got one person in the one marketplace is one reason but probably the main reason is and listen a lot of people won't want to admit this in real estate but i can tell you if there was a real estate agent that was selling a property and there were two buyers. One buyer had a property to sell in that area as well and one didn't. There is always going to be a preference from the real estate agent to sell it to the buyer that's got another property to sell. End of story. That's basic economics. You're going to get two commissions, not one. And you're also going to find that there are some advantages, and that is simple things like coordinating settlements to take place at the same time, being able to, you know, once you've got the relationship, like being able, for instance, Phil, you might want to bring tradespeople in, right, to measure up on the new place that you want to get some curtains, right, or you want to, you know, get the family to come through and have a second look at it, what have you. It's just going to be a lot easier when you've got this one agent that's doing both properties, right? So um, I just think the easy for, thing for you to say is, hey, listen, you know, I'm buying through this guy. There's nothing wrong with you guys. And the truth is, if I was buying through you, you'd be getting it, you know, as well. Um, uh, but having said that, Phil, i got to tell you, the guy that you're buying from mustn't be too bad because there are lots of instances in real estate that the person that you buy from in the same area doesn't get the listing you sell. That happens all the time as well because, you know, in real estate, Phil, when you're buying something, you're buying the property. Mm. In real estate, when you're selling something, what are you doing? you're buying the agent two different things right when you're buying you see the agent once or twice in the process when you're selling 
You see the agent every second day and they're on the phone every other day and they're talking to you by FaceTime and they're coming in physically showing buyers. They become part of your life. So I don't think you'd be giving your listing to this agent anyway if you didn't feel comfortable and the only reason you gave it to him was because you were buying. It's the fact that you're buying which makes it convenient, but you also rate this guy, I think. Yeah, well, I had a good dealing with him as a, as a buyer, right? I thought he acted well and ethically and he... You know, he, he tried to represent his vendor as well as he possibly could and was accommodating to making a transaction happen. And for me, that's sort of pretty pragmatic and business-like. So I was happy to give him the listing. No, no worries whatsoever. But it, it actually, I actually felt I actually felt bad uh, to the other guy for not winning the listing, and that's just the way I'm wired. You, so, have, uh, you, have, you told, have you told him, yeah, Phil? I told him, and I pretty much said to him what you mentioned um, straight down the line. I told him exactly the reason why. And he was asking me, what can we do? What can we do? I was like, nothing, you know, it's like, it's just a fate of complete, but, um, yeah. Oh, well, I, well, look, look, I can, I, I can tell you, I train real estate what, agents. Tom, he, didn't, he didn't ask whether or not it was commission either. He didn't say, he didn't drop his price. He didn't do anything like that. You know, it wasn't like, oh, but I can give you this. He, he sort of listened to me and he went, okay, well, all right, no worries. So, um, can, so he played this, it well. This is, this is, uh, this is a this is a good lesson for our for our listeners. If they're mm. faced with this scenario, this is the template to handle it. If you're the second agent, right? Number one is I'd say to you, firstly, Phil, can I ask you, have you actually gone off and formalised an authority to sell with the other agent? So step number one is I want to work out. Is there anything I can do? Because if the paperwork has been done, it's done. The referee has blown their whistle, right? We're having a discussion about something that's not savable, right? So that would be step one. Step number two, Phil, if I worked out that you were intending to do it, but you hadn't actually signed an agency agreement yet, I would bring up the scenario and say something along the lines of this. Phil, I understand your situation. In fact, we deal with this every day. And what I can tell you is that you have two choices here. Choice number one is that you go with the one agent and you put everything into that one agent and you keep your fingers crossed that everything works out and that you get the best price and that it's good. But there's a little bit of risk there. Option number two, is that you treat the two things separately. What you do is you want to buy at the best price and you want to sell at the best price. And you want to keep these two things independent because at the end of the day, what we really care about in real estate is the changeover figure. What I'd like to do is just to have one final conversation with you where I can sit down and explain to you why I actually think your home is 10% better off going with us than with any other agent. And that in this process could mean an extra $300,000. How open-minded would you be to sit down and talk about what we could do to get you a $300,000 better net result in your pocket? I would actually say so step number one is find out whether it's solvable. Then step number two, explain how the goal in real estate is to have these two things as separate items, you know? And, um, um, but it sounds like, it sounds like you're, uh, you're buying and selling field. That's what it sounds like. Well, they're both, they're both investment properties, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, buying and selling similar, similar area. Um, you know, just, yeah, just sort of an interesting scenario. So you know, as I mentioned, I, 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 I felt bad to, to the to the other agent, and you know, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of a lot of um, vendors think that way, right? Um, when you sort of have you, a relationship with people, so yeah. Well, if you're if 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 you were if you if you're, if, you're, if, you, if you're the true trusted advisor, if you're the true trusted advisor, Phil, what uh, they would do is they would say, "Hey, Phil, why don't we actually have a look at?" on the advantages of actually selling or not selling 
and mm. exhaust exhaust that. You know, that's the true trusted advisor sort of saying, hey, let's let's put that aside because Phil, you know, one of the things that you need to understand is when you sell a property and an investment property, there's capital gains tax involved. And you might be able to achieve a similar benefit if you want to access funds maybe we can just revalue your initial investment property pull funds out of that allocate that towards your um, second purchase that you want to buy and and look at that but i'm mate you're a smart guy i'm sure you've already you i mean you wouldn't be doing this if you hadn't sort of worked out whether it was worth keeping the the original property yeah, I, I just can't deal with the headaches and maintenance around this particular property and it's only it's going to get worse so yeah maybe one day it's, I'll, I'll regret the decision but it's done what it's needed to do in the portfolio it's it's grown a lot it's probably doubled in or more than twice its value from purchase uh, sort of in eight years so you know I think we're selling it for about 800 grand and we bought it for 280 or 300 grand so you know job done well so that's a that's a good that's a good profit you know Phil something uh, for, for your own interest do you know in i have never sold an investment property in my life really never this is the first one i've, I've sold yeah. yeah yeah i struggle i struggle i struggle with it i had a i had a jewish i had a jewish uh, landlord that i used to look after in my office in marrickville mr abaya mm. his name was and he said to me he said to me if you've got to sell your home that you live in because you need to move to another area another city you need a bigger home you sell that home and then you buy another home but don't sell any investment properties. It'll give you a big headache in the future. He said that. He said, don't, don't sell it. I said, oh, what if you need the money? He said, well, he goes, just go to the bank and pull the equity out. You'll be 20% worse. You'll be 20% worse off because they'll only lend you 80% on that investment property. But you're going to actually get out of paying the taxes and the legal fees involved in the buying and selling process. But you've got strong reasons there, and that is that you, uh, you're you a busy man, Phil, that doesn't want to have a property that appears to have had its uh, wear and tear go to a level that it's probably better for someone else to take it on. And Yeah, yeah. You know, some yeah. first homeowner will probably buy it and make it their home. But, you know, that was really good counsel. That sounds like a very smart chap uh, who he manages managing his stuff for. And that's my philosophy towards property investing. Um, got quite a large portfolio. Uh, it's the first property that's sold. You know, and this is an, an anomaly. I would have held on to it, but I just went, yeah, why not? Um, Phil, I've got to, I want to share, can I share the story with Mr. Abaya? Big lesson there. Mr. Yeah. Abaya walked into our office with a pair of shorts that you'd see you'd buy at Lowe's, a pair of those men's slipper type, you know, th slippers, you'd call them, right? Yeah. Um, and a white singlet. Right, <laughs> yeah. and um, didn't look didn't didn't look like he'd showered that day. It was just he looked really messy. Right, he walks in, he walks in with a key, and goes, "Hello, hello." We all look there. He goes, "I've got a unit down. I can't remember this. I think it was Francis Street, Mar. I've got a unit in Francis Street, Marrickville. I'm not prepared to give a management. I'll give a first week's letting if you rent it out." Here's the key. Are you interested? Right. Anyway, with, I thought to myself, this guy's, you know, wacko. We're young. We hop in the car. He goes, I'll follow you. He gets into this little red pulse. I still remember it, a red beaten up pulsar. And you know what the story was, Phil? We get to the block of units and he goes, here it is here. And I go, which unit's yours? He says, oh, they're all mine. He goes, it's unit number seven. So I look up and I look at my business partner, George. I said, George, he's got the block here. There was like 45, 50 units in the block. And then we find out at that this visit, he owns that other block down there and he owns this other block. And then we work out, we thought, shit, you never judge a book by the cover, Phil. Never. You know, that girl or guy that walks to an auction wearing, you know, Armani clothes, you know, pulls up in the flash car, often they're sitting there, they've got no money to buy the place, right? You get someone, shorts, bit of a gut hanging out, walks in, you think to yourself, oh, this guy can't buy it. Man, he's the final bidder. You never, ever assume, I'm telling you, never assume in real estate.
Yeah, mate. It's uh, you see it all the time. I find it all very entertaining. It's it's often the people with the most money don't want to look like they've got any money, right? That's uh, I learned that a long time ago. So. Yes, very very true. It's very very true. And um, and it was one of listen. It was one of the things you know when Gavin when I was talking to Gavin Rubenstein before Gavin Gavin before Gavin accepted doing the block. Gavin and I were sitting down having a session together. This is like about a year and a half ago. And he said, mate, you know, there's this thing happening here. And, you know, he goes, tell me your view. Tell me the pros and cons. He goes, I want you to be the devil here. You tell me the pros and cons. And I said, well, let's accept it. One of the issues is that this sounds like it's going to be a flash show. And it's about what I see on Million Dollar Listing in America. It sounds like it's something along the lines of that. And let's have a look at it. The 80-year-old older guy that sits in Vaucluse won't be impressed, but the young aspiring executive that's 35 years of age that's bought something in Rushcutters Bay or Double Bay will be impressed. So, you're, 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 you know, and, and, and that's sort of the way it's transpired, that there's a group of people that like to keep things quiet, low-key, yeah. And there's another group of people that want the world to know I'm rich, I have influence, I have power. Where are you, Phil? Sorry, where am I? I on this one. Sorry, where, well, where, where, where am I right now, environmentally or mentally? <laughs> no, know? on the spectrum. On the spectrum. Oh, mate, you, you see. <laughs> well, I've got no money, so, so it's there a lot of There you go. There you go. There you go. He's keeping it low profile. I've got no money. There I've got go. no money, mate. I'm a struggling small businessman, Tom. You know that. Um, got- yeah, but I'm not. I'm not a flash guy. You know, I still drive. I've, I've, I've driven the same car for nearly 20 years. You know, um, which I've sort of. You know, my wife has a nice car, but no, I'm, I'm happy with just what I got. I don't really. I'm not a fancy sort of guy. You know, I don't spend much I, money. I, I want to. I, I should write. I should write a blog post or shoot a video on my 10 biggest learnings from Mr. Abaya. Great, great man. He, he became our, he became a management. He was our biggest landlord. He became our biggest landlord. And how many properties happened, did you manage for him? Oh, 150, Oof, right? That's a lot of properties. 150, he was, he was a, the biggest landlord. And one of the things that came out of it is he ended up becoming a bit like a mentor because every interaction you'd have, and it's really weird, Phil, a lot of these guys actually love giving you lessons mm. it's really you know they love giving you lessons right he how, how did he make because, all his money tom how, how did he make all his money was he just just property guy or was he a builder who who started young and early and smart with um money? i don't off the top of my head he'd been doing property for a lot of his life up until then but i think originally he was um i think it was in surrey hills in the rag trade okay. right and, and then they got the money out of the rag trade and invested in uh, in property, you know. So it was lots of lots of blocks of units. But, I mean, you know, when you brought up about the car, he used to say, boys, don't spend your money on cars. That's metal that rusts. It goes down in price. Spend your money on land. Spend your money on land. And that's why he had this, this beaten up red car. Mr... I think his name was Mr. Bayaya, Mr. Bayaya. He had a red pulsar. Um, so, and, 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 another, and another lesson he all, always had is don't worry about having your being looking better than your next door neighbor, right? He, he always used to say, don't worry about the neighbors. Don't worry about the neighbors. That's a bit like the Joneses, isn't it? You know? Yeah. Yeah, look, you know, you've got to march to the beat of your own drum, right? Uh, you're typically happier if you're that way. If you're benchmarking yourself perpetually with other people, that's not bad for a, you know, to help align where you want to go in life, but it's a slippery slope, Tom. I think there's always going to be someone that's got more money. There's always going to be, and there is, a, I mean, there's always going to be someone that's got more money, smarter kids, better looks, funnier, you know, that's life, so... If that's the game, how, how do you feel about that, Tom? Seeing how one sided this particular uh, duo is, mate. Better looking, smarter, funnier, uh, professionally better off, mate. You're making me feel bad. I'll take that as a comment. It's the best you're going to get from me, mate. Yeah. 
<laughs> All righty. Good one, Tom. Hey, 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 uh, uh, hey that yeah. quick one. Um, for those who have tuned in all the way through this podcast we're sort of rambling a bit today but this is the way we like to do it the women in real estate awards tom which you're coming along to it's in um sure am uh, the 11th of december i'm going to get in trouble with that i think it is uh restrictions have changed uh the in new south wales uh they've brought forward the two square meter rules for uh official events so it's going to be a new release of tickets we sold out the women in real estate awards like about four months ago before covid hit and it was completely capped out. But I've just been told there's going to be a new release of tickets uh, uh, available. So um, uh, watch this space. Uh, if you want to get involved, get in touch with the team. Uh, best way to do it would be um, you can call 0299-223300. Uh, they're going to be hot property, these. I think we can get about another 100 people there because they've changed these restrictions. So 0299-223300 or editor at realestatebusiness.com.au. I'll let them know to keep an eye on that stuff, Tom. But um, just means that it's even going to be bigger and better. Philly, thank you. Looking forward to it. I've just realised that I'm way late for something. So signing off. It's been great chatting. Well, I've been the See chatting. You, you've been doing the listening. Thank you so much. Right. See you, mate. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.